to begin, I would like to look at art tonight, specifically fear in art, because art is an excellent mirror through which we can look at culturally specific fears or anxieties. And uh, some of these societal uneases, uh, these things that may not be spoken about are expressed through art. So again, I would, look, I would like to look at the, <laughs> art, I would like to look at the mechanism of using fear in storytelling and talk about the origins of horror as a genre, which is something that still thrills us today. So elements of horror, or using fear as an entertainment tool, has existed in storytelling for thousands of years. Uh, ghost stories have gone back millennia, and uh, they express a lot of the fears that we have about the unknown. Common cultural fears are things like fear of supernatural forces, fear of evil, fear of death, or fear of what comes after death, because no one knows it's unknown. And the unknown is scary. So. In contemplating the unknown, there was a hallmark moment in literature where uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet kind of helped inspire or kick off the horror genre. So for tonight's invocation, I'd, look, I'd like to look at fear of death and the unknown as expressed in Hamlet. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in our philosophy. Essentially, we don't know what we don't know, and the magnitude of that unknown is terrifying. So throughout this play, as I'm sure all of you read in senior year in, in high school, Hamlet struggles with, the, with uncertainty, he struggles with the unknown, and he wrestles with fear of death and fear of consequence. So this fear, this grounded sentiment of fear of the unknown, it really resonated with other writers that came after, uh, after Shakespeare. So Inspired by the dark, brooding, melancholy hero of Hamlet, and especially by all the ghosty bits in Hamlet, 65 years later, Horace Walpole penned The Castle of Otranto. So when he released it, he claimed that he had found a lost medieval work that he had translated from Italian, uh, and then it became outrageously popular, and then he was like, ha-ha, you fools, I penned it myself, and then it became less popular. Anyway, this novel drew heavily from medieval traditions, and it also borrowed heavily from Hamlet. And so he put together this, this really overwrought, sensational tale, uh, and it's, it's kind of ridiculously overblown. So stylistically, the novel is very dark and eerie. The cast, we have a melancholy, brooding villain. We have useless, oft-fainting women. We have a hero with just a unfathomable backstory, and uh, it all takes place in a crumbling, ruined ancestral castle that is rife with trapdoors and hidden passages and, and traps, and, uh, and all of our characters are running around trying to deal with an incredibly gruesome death, an ancient curse, menacing supernatural affects, and even more menacing supernaturals, and then ghosts and witches and just like a whole ton of ter terrifying crap. So, yes. And the lead pipe and the... the study. So anyway, all of these elements that Walpole exploited in his work, he did not invent any of them. He, he drew them from previous literary tr tradition, but he combined them in a sensational way that absolutely thrilled his readers. And because of the gloomy setting in this medieval type castle, the castle of Otranto became the first, gothic nor the, the go first gothic novel kicking off the genre of gothic horror. So named because of the gothic architectural style of medieval castles that are the setting for this type of story. So hallmarks of the gothic horror genre are intense characters, creepy atmosphere, dealing with the morbid, all which uh, this art points out just how squicked out we are by death. And these elements that we saw in the Castle of Otranto are, are again kind of used as a template uh, by writers throughout the end of the 1700s and the beginning of the 1800s. So this is just a handful of some of the more notable Gothic horror fiction writers, uh, but it became immensely popular. These novels were shocking and delighting audiences with their eerie sensationalism and macabre elements, uh, really pushing people to experience both wonder as well as terror while contemplating their, their mortality. And also, this genre, uh, since it was new and it was about looking within and, and embracing romanticism, it also gave space for phenomenal female writers to start becoming novelists. <clears throat> now, 
Concurrent to the English Gothic obsession, parallel macabre styles also developed on the continent. So you have the Roman Noir, the Black Novel of France, and the Schau Roman, which is li literally a shudder novel, novel of Germany. So these, these gained popularity in the continent, but however, English and American appetites for horror began to wane. And by the 1820s, it really fell out of vogue. Uh, and scary stories were just kind of this like weird, unfashionable thing that those weird Germans were doing over there. Like, Ugh, that's never fashionable. So Gothic horror quietly subsided from popular English literature for 20 years until this guy came along. He completely reinvented the genre, adding levels of psychological intrigue to tales of architectural and aristocratic decay, death, and insanity. His stories fixated less on the external sources of terror, like less on the supernatural forces and more on the internal uh, sources of terror, looking or creating unreliable mad narrators as a source of terror. So very early on with his first stories, critics balked at his style and dismissed him. They're like, why are you creating these German stories? That, that's not literature. So he retorted, Terror is not of Germany, but of the soul. So he continued writing, and he wrote incredibly well about terror, and he argued that it was a legitimate literary subject, and he really stoked the fires of Gothic horror again, showcasing an anxiety about death at a time when cultural attitudes towards death and grieving were shifting uneasily from traditional sphere into the public sphere. So he also captured some other terrifying and pragmatic fears of death that Kelly will be explaining later this evening. Uh, as it, it turns out, as Americans moved away from rural life and from traditional roles, they started developing new senses of identity. And when you have a very rugged sense of identity, uh, that goes hand in hand with an increased fear of death. So as Americans were, were developing this national persona, fear of death was really ratcheting upward, which shows in his works, and he really, uh, he really captured this cultural anxiety. So again, this kick-started a flood of renewed interest in the genre of horror, and you had uh, several popular writers embracing this gothic novel genre and, and really embracing horror and terror in literature. So uh, gothic fiction and gothic horror regained their foothold in the American and English consciousness, and uh, it set the foundations for horror, it set the foundations for thriller genre, it set the foundations for science fiction, thank you Mary Shelley, it set the foundation for detective stories, thank you Edgar, and this gothic fiction, uh, it gave us lasting villains and monsters as an outlet for our fears and our cultural anxieties. So again, art and using fear in art gives, gives us a way to explore the inexplicable through entertainment which is what we'll be doing here tonight. So again, uh, please raise a glass to the genre of horror as a distraction from contemplating and fearing our own mortality. All right. As we reset the stage here, I'd like to Welcome tonight's speakers. We have speaking on very terrifying tales tonight. We have Richard Cody Nichols, we have Kelly Jensen, Casey Crowell, Avani Gadani, Christian Kajikal, and we also have joining us for the first time a new speaker, Andrew Thompson. So please give them all a big hand as we welcome them to the stage. And kicking off a very terrifying tale of very real physical monsters, please welcome Avani Gadani to the stage. <laughs> 